so no, that's exactly you know sort of where that where that comes because the idea is right that these patches are like islands because they're surrounded by um, not not by the ocean like the Channel Islands but in this case by development and roads and things. Um, so this is actually so as I mentioned there are some species that we still find throughout the landscape small patches large patches um, and so we actually worked with uh, Katie Delaney who's a biologist with us now she was a postdoc with me at UCLA, um, and we said, okay, what about genetics? What's going on in terms of genetics for these small species that are still across the landscape, but are they affected in more subtle ways? And so we looked at genetics for four species, western fence lizards, side blotch lizards, and western skinks. So again, these are ones that were still present in the small patches. And then we also looked at wren tits, actually, a bird. And you would think, well, birds fly, right? So this shouldn't be an issue for them. Um, but we wanted to check and we looked, we used rentits because they're really small and pretty habitat specific. They really like coastal sage scrub, they're not going to fly sort of over big open areas typically. And so we thought um, if there was a bird where you might see something, then they would be one to look at. Um, so this is what some of that genetic data looked like. And I'll just talk about this for a second because I'm going to show this again for bot, this kind of thing again for bobcats and for mountain lions. Basically, we put all the genetic data into this program called Structure, um, and we said, how many different clusters are there genetically? And then we asked, how do those map onto or not map onto the landscape? And the, this is for skinks, and you can, you can see we had five different clusters, um, and they really went very well with what the landscape looked like. So here's one cluster that we had. This is near our current office there in Thousand Oaks, and then this is a different cluster and that was a different cluster. So we saw significant genetic differentiation. Uh, even the, though these species are still throughout the landscape, they are starting to be affected genetically. Um, and we saw that for all four species, just to <laughs> uh, keep going here. But we saw it for all three lizards, and we even saw it for the bird, for rentids. Um, and then this is putting all those species together. These red areas are the, where the, the most genetic differentiation and where the oldest and widest area of development, this is in Thousand Oaks was, is where we saw the most differentiation for, for all four species. Um, and so, as I said, we saw significant genetic divergence, and I didn't show it here, but we, we also saw decreased genetic variability for all four of those species. Um, it was related to the age of the patch, so how long has it been isolated, uh, to how isolated it was, so how far is it from other patches. And then the presence of roads and, and the freeway, like 23. But I think, you know, one thing that we think, I think is really interesting is there was a similar pattern for all four of these species, even though, you know, two of them are fairly related, cyclops and one's infectious, but skinks is a totally different family. Birds are birds, right? Clearly pretty different, but we see the same pattern in all those species, and so we think it's a pretty strong pattern of fragmentation. All right, so now I'm gonna talk uh, about carnivores. So we've been studying mammalian carnivores uh, since 1996, actually, so 27 years consecutively for bobcats. Um, we started the study because carnivores need a ton, of, a ton of space, just their home ranges are big, they disperse over large distances. And so if there's a group of animals that's gonna be affected by urbanization and fragmentation, carnivores are probably gonna be high on the list. And so, as I said, we've been studying them since 96. And again, as with everything, our goal is to understand what are the effects of urbanization and fragmentation on carnivores. And so we've studied a number of different aspects of their ecology and behavior um, and how those relate to development. So urban association, like how, they, how much are they using natural areas versus urban areas versus in-between areas like golf courses or landscape parks or that kind of thing. What are their home ranges like? How are they moving across the landscape? And importantly, what are corridors and barriers for movement? or barriers to movement, how well are they surviving, and when they don't, what do they die from? Um, diet, I'm not going to talk about all these things today just because of time, but we've studied all of these different things. Um, are they able to disperse? Are they reproducing? And then what about disease and toxicants? So I'll talk a little bit about some of these things, um, specifically for bobcats and lions, and a little bit for coyotes as well. So we've been studying bobcats, like I said, uh, since 90, 1996. As far as we know, the longest consecutive intensive study of bobcats that anyone has ever done. We're getting close to bobcat 400, um, so that'll be kind of exciting. Um, and with, with all the carnivores, the big challenge that I want to talk about, and that we'll, talk, we'll see um, something we're trying to do about it, you know, with the crossing, 
is this loss of connectivity. So we no longer have connections, um, effective connections between these various natural areas. Um, and that's because, basically, because of roads uh, and development. This is actually Liberty Canyon Road here, so we'll go right out there um, uh, after we're done here. And so the first five years or so, this is from a paper we did in, 2000, in 2003, where we looked at home ranges, in this case for coyotes, um, and we did the same thing for bobcats. And you can see this is not all at one time. This is over those five years, but lots of different home ranges for coyotes, but you can see they're all either on north of the freeway or south of the freeway, and some of them are often right up against the freeway, so often the freeway will be a home range boundary, essentially, for, for carnivores. This is the same thing for bobcats, lots of home ranges up to the freeway, but not across. Um, this is some GPS data that was sort of more recent. Um, this is actually, so that's Las Virginia, so this is just up the road here, and you can see this animal never, never crossed 101, and actually really basically didn't cross lost versions. So even sometimes smaller roads um, can be a barrier to movement as well, especially say for bobcats and some smaller species. So then we wanted to know, um, again, just like with the, with the reptiles, you know, we, we see effects of fragmentation, but are those effects affecting not just movement, but also genetics? Um, this is actually from a bobcat that I was studying in, um, in Northern California. This is a long time ago. We use gloves all the time now. And like <laughs> Don't do this at home. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but we, uh, we used markers, and now sort of all the genetics are changing, and people are doing whole genomes and lots of other things, but which we could talk about if people are interested. But we, for this work, we used microsatellites, which were a, a marker that people used for a long time that evolves really quickly. And so you could potentially see the effects of something that's relatively recent, like the freeway. And so for bobcats, what we did, and this is work we did together with colleagues at UCLA, is we wanted to compare <clears throat> the genetics for populations on the same side of the freeway and then compare that across the freeway and see if we see significant differences. And the answer is that we did for bobcats. So this is a FST, which is a measure of genetic differences between populations. And there was twice as much genetic difference across the freeway than there was along the freeway, even though there's basically no geographic distance there, right? But you have this major barrier of the freeway. Um, and then we saw, um, we saw the same thing uh, for coyotes, actually. I'm not sure if I have that slide. Um, so, this is, so we did that. This is the same structure analysis with bobcats. Um, and so we, again, we put all the genetic data into the structure program, and we asked it how many clusters there were. This is actually from that work I did as a graduate student in Northern California. These are all in a different cluster, so that's good, right? Because that's 400 miles away. Um, but the ones from Southern California fell into three clusters: uh, the red and the, the red, sorry, the green and the blue, and then the red one over here. And the red, the ones in the red cluster, were almost all south of the freeway. And then north of the freeway, we had kind of this mix between northwest versus northeast of the blue and the green clusters. And so we, again, we're seeing significant difference. One of the things that's cool, I'll just mention quickly, is uh, these ones that were asterisks are kind of like in the wrong place, right? Like here's animals that belong in the red cluster that were uh, caught north of the freeway, but all these ones with um, asterisks, almost all of them from our telemetry data, we knew that they either lived right near the freeway or had crossed the freeway. And so we think that, that it looks like those were, were migrants that may have gone back and forth. Uh, and then we saw the same thing for coyotes. So for coyotes, Again, much bigger difference in terms of genetic differentiation across the freeway uh, than along the freeway. And then this is um, more recently, I had a grad student at UCLA, uh, Laurel Sirius, and she extended the bobcat work um, to some other areas. So she actually did work east of 405 here. So this is um, animals, so again, north, these two are north of the freeway and this is south of the freeway. So again, you see a big difference between north and south but also east and west of 405. Um, so again, we saw significant, this is a similar value to what we saw before. Um, so that was sort of good confirmation, but we also saw significant differentiation across 405. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, talk about mountain lions. I think that's Jeff actually here, who's, um, who's gonna spend the rest of the time with us. He uh, runs all of our field work on the mountain lion project, so. Um, this is a mountain lion. <laughs> uh, that seems obvious, right? But it turns out that all kinds of 
kinds of people see a wild cat and they call it a mountain lion and, you know, I don't know. We like to say 90% of the time. It's not. Uh, sometimes it is, you know, certainly, but it's just incredibly rare um, to see them. So you can see the you know, big long tail here. You know, they're a lot bigger, but if it's 200 meters away and the light is bad, you know, and you haven't seen them a bunch, you know, you could easily um, confuse them. Bobcats have a much shorter tail there. Uh, they have this cool facial ruff um, on the face there. It's a little hard to see here, but they have ear tufts as well. And then they can be very spotted like this one, although sometimes they're not that spotted and so, you know, there can be a lot of variability. So, so we've been studying mountain lions since 2002. Um, so not quite as long as the bobcats, but still uh, over 20 years. Um, so we track the adults and then actually we monitor reproduction as well, like checking out the kittens. This is our fam most famous mountain lion, P22. And this is a picture um, with the Hollywood sign in the background. So he lived at Griffith Park, um, and many of you may have heard about him. He actually died um, a couple of months ago. Um, anyway, so we've been studying them um, from, again, since 2002. And <clears throat> the areas that we intensively studied bobcats, and where most of those you know, 400 animals come from, were right here. Um, this entire area is our mountain lion study area, basically. Uh, and we assumed from the beginning of the study that the Santa Monica Mountains by themselves were probably not big enough for a viable population of mountain lions. Um, and so these connections, as I talked about, you know, we have this loss of connectivity. So connection between the Santa Monica's and Simi Hills, the Simi Hills and the Santa Susana's, ultimately all the way to Los Padres, those connections were going to be, be really important. And that's exactly what we've seen uh, through our work studying the lions. So this is actually just from the first four mountain lions that we studied. Uh, this is P1 here, this home range here, um, adult. So males, this is true of bobcats too actually, but males have much bigger home ranges than females, typically three times as big. And you can see that P1 used the entire Santa Monica's from out here by you all on the west end to all the way over by 405. And, and that's not an outrageously big home range for a mountain lion, like that's pretty, pretty standard. This is the first female that we follow, P2. Uh, you can see her area is much smaller, and that's typical. Um, and so you can imagine maybe there's space for another female out to the west, and then another female home range out to the east. Uh, one thing that you see in mountain lion populations, and actually we've started to document it in the broadcast too, is sometimes females will overlap like with their close relatives, like mothers and daughters. And so maybe you have room for six to eight females. And sometimes we've seen you know, a couple of males as opposed to just one. Either way, you're talking about, you know, basically less than a dozen animals that are reproducing in this population, and that's just not enough genetically or demographically uh, for a viable population. And so just from the very beginning, and then we've been seeing something similar for these whole 20 years. So what's happening with mountain lions relative to freeways? Um, there is one freeway, so 118, where we have seen we have seen a little bit more movement, um, and this is, so this is actually, these are, um, we had two mountain lions, the green points are P3, so early in the study, and the, the pink ones are P4. P3 went back and forth, he made seven round trips, so 14 times he crossed, uh, he crossed 118. So this is the, the Rocky Peak area, Santa Susana Pass. One thing you notice here, right, it's like development in Simi Valley, development in the San Fernando Valley, and this is kind of the last place where there's natural habitat on both sides for 118. We're actually doing some work right now, which we could talk about later if people are interested, but we're studying connectivity right in that area right now um, and hoping to do some things to make it better. Um, but here's, there's an, actually a nice crossing there at Corganville, um, and there's a photo that some folks got of P3, there's, so you can see the graffiti on the bottom, there's his, his collar. That's a nice crossing. Uh, you, know, you can see you can see through it, and it's pretty vague. It's actually for hikers and equestrians, um, and so he used it regularly. Uh, so, although it's interesting that we've actually been monitoring it intensively for the last year plus, and we do not see a ton of wildlife use of it. I mean, he used it, and they we see some use, but it gets a ton of use by people. Hmm. Um, and so I thought this crossing was actually better. <laughs> better than it was since we started to collect data on it, which is interesting, um, which we could talk more about. Um, 
But anyway, we have had some movement of lines across 118. What about 101? A little bit, but, but very little. So this is early on in the study, P2, that second line that we were tracking the first female. And you can see this is one night when she got up close to the freeway. This is right in the Liberty Canyon area where we're going to go. Um, and then she, this was at nine, 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock. And then she went back to this area, actually, in the middle of Lieutenant Monica's. Um, and then this is what that area looks like, so we'll go actually to this area um, in a little bit. Um, but you can see, you know, currently, before we build the crossing, um, you know, it's, it's not great in terms of, of, of movement, so you would have to come down, cross this road, Agura Road here, which we'll park on, navigate around that office building, uh, and then go under Liberty Canyon Road here. And, and that's not something that's easy for animals to do, it turns out. And we've actually been monitoring, Jeff has a bunch of cameras right here, and we've been monitoring that, and you know it gets some use, but but not very much. Even though basically all the species are coming right up to it, um, but not going across. So what about 101 broadly across the study? So this is many thousands of mountain lion points. Um, you can see here across the Santa Monica's, but if you zoom in, so this is the western end out by you all, and you can see lots of points right up to the freeway, but basically not crossing. Same thing in the central Santa Monica, and then at the, in the eastern end, in the San Fernando Valley, they often don't even get close to the freeway because of how developed it is, right? The freeway is just a development corridor there. Um, so, so basically, very little movement across 101 for mountain lions, same thing for five. So again, and we have even more animals now. This is um, you know, sort of a slide that has a, a few of them, but you can see lots of points right up against five, um, and then never going across, and then this is 405. Here we have six different animals, and then we have even more now going right up to 405. I will talk about one case at the end here where we did have one cross, which was interesting. Um, so is that a problem that the lions aren't crossing the freeway? So there's two major issues. Uh, like I said, we have very low dispersal into the Santa Monica's, and there was one exception, which I'll mention, P12. Um, and so that, if you don't have much movement into a population, especially a small population like ours, that can lead to low genetic diversity, um, especially if you also have inbreeding, which I'll mention in a second. Um, and then we have very little dispersal out of the Santa Monica's as well. Um, and typically in a mountain lion population, every young male disperses to get somewhere else, and even half the young females typically do. Um, and so if they're not able to disperse, there's a couple things that we've been seeing, which we think are, are likely more common than they otherwise would be. One is males running into each other and, and fighting, uh, and, then <clears throat> with, uh, and then males and females running into each other and mating, which is you know, good for the population, um, but not if they're closely related, which is one of the things that we're seeing. So in terms of dispersal of young mountain lions out of the Santa Monica's, we've followed a number of young males, and it's even more than this now, and basically we've had None of these animals successfully disperse somewhere and find somewhere to make their, their own home range um, out of the Santa Monica's to get somewhere else. Um, and many of them have died sometimes on roads, like this is down on the Alba Canyon Road. Uh, this is one young male that ended up at the promenade in Santa Monica, actually, and ended up being killed uh, by police officers. Um, but one of the things we saw, especially early in the study, that was pretty common is that adult males would interact with mostly with some adult males, but also sometimes even with females and even one time with an adult female, um, which seems like a bad strategy, and they would, and they would kill them. <laughs> um, and so this is from a study uh, in 2020 where we actually, this intraspecific strife, we call it, where they're fighting with each other and even killing each other, uh, was an important cause of mortality on the same level with vehicles and rodenticide poisoning, which I'll talk about um, a little bit more. We've actually had a really, we can talk about this more along the way if we want, we've had a really tough year in the last year with mortality of mountain lions, um, and most of those have been from vehicles, not all of them, but most of them, and so actually vehicles is now our, our number one cause, um, but we've definitely, like I said, had this, this intraspecific interaction has been a, an important cause of mortality, and we think, like I said, it's exacerbated by the fact that animals aren't able to disperse. So this is kind of what it should look like if you had plenty of connectivity. This is a young male that we were tracking uh, at, the west, at the east end of the Santa Susanas, and he dispersed out, so this was his home range early on, he dispersed out along the Santa Clara and 126. He crossed the freeway, or yeah, I guess it is a freeway there actually, between Ventura and Santa Paula, 
he went way up here in Los Padres, and then he settled in a home range there, right? So that's what they're sort of trying to do, but if they're stuck in the Santa Monica and then not able to disperse, um, then, that's, then that's not very possible. And then the other thing I, that, that we think is more common than it would otherwise be is we see this breeding between close relatives. Um, so this is the first set of kittens that we documented, P5, 6, 7, and 8. And the parents were P1 and P2. Uh, but then later, P1, the father, mated with P6, his daughter. Um, and they had P13. Uh, and then this is another case. So P12, who was an adult male, um, that came in after P1. So he mated with P13, and they had 17, 18, and 19. But then he mated with P19, his daughter, and they had 23 and 24. Um, and then he mated uh, with 23, who was his daughter and his granddaughter, um, and they had 36 and 37. So for 36 and 37, P12 is the father, the grandfather, and the great grandfather. Um, and so, and they don't. We don't think they know like who they're. They're just out there trying to mate with whoever's available, right? But if dispersal is not possible in the way that it otherwise would be, they end up running into close relatives and mating, and that's also bad uh, for genetic diversity. And so, what have we seen in terms of genetics with the mountain lions? So this is again uh, the structure program where we put genetics for the mountain lions into that program. We said how many clusters are there? In this case, there were three. So there's this green cluster the blue cluster and the red cluster and the green one, you can see these are all the animals in the Santa Monica's very clearly in that one cluster. This is north of 101, and actually this is east of five. So we also saw, in this case, differences in the kind of makes sense based on what I showed you about how they're rarely crossing five, right? Um, that, that there's genetic differences across five as well. Um, and so this is what that looks like, green cluster in the Santa Monica's, blue north of 101, and P12 is over here, like very clearly in this blue cluster, and then he made it with P13, in this, the, clearly in the green cluster, and then these are his offspring, and you can see they're a nice mix of the blue cluster and the green cluster. Um, interestingly, this is P23 and P24, right, so those ones are where P12 is the father and the grandfather, and you can see uh, they're like three quarters from that blue cluster. Um, so, good thing that he came in and brought new genetic material, but then not as good that he's starting to breed uh, with close relatives. Um, so I, just a, one last, well, a couple last things about the genetics of the mountain lions. So we did some work with, this is a, another postdoc at UCLA, um, and he did some modeling of the population and basically asked, you know, sort of what's going on, what will go on in the future ba and based on some different scenarios. And so he was modeling heterozygosity. I mean, he just modeled how the population was doing and whether it kept going, basically, over 50 years or, or more. And then he looked at it with a few different scenarios. So no immigration at all into the Santa Monica's. The current levels that we were seeing at, seeing at that time, which was one animal came in, P12, over 12 years. Uh, and then if you increase it a little bit, like one to every four years and one to every two years, and you can see here's heterozygosity, and it just keeps going down over those 50 years. And this blue level, that's kind of the level they were seeing in Florida, right? Um, and so, you know, ideally you sort of not like to get close to that. Uh, but if you, you can see that if you increase immigration a bit, um, then you keep the genetic diversity a, a bit higher. And, and here, like over 50 years, it's basically staying pretty level. Um, and you can see this, this is one every two years, right? This is not a huge number. Like, we don't need a parade of mountain lions crossing the freeway, right? We just need a few to be able to do it and to get across and, and breed, right? So if they just come across, that doesn't help, but they have to, um, they have to breed as well. There's one other last thing on the mountain lions and the genetics here is in, um, so just a little over three years ago in 2020, we captured a young male, P1, um, and there were two things that were interesting about him. One is he had this kink at the end of his tail, um, this distal tail kink, and then he also, uh, only one of his two testes had descended into the scrotum, so that's called um, cryptorchidism. Uh, and these are exactly the same kind of things that they were seeing in Florida before 1995. So 90% of the animals had a kink in the tail like that, and two-thirds of the males one or both of the testes didn't descend. And actually, if both testes 
don't descend, at least in Florida, none of those males were reproducing. Um, so that was unfortunate. We kind of had hoped never to see that, right? Um, but it sort of adds to the urgency potentially of the crossing. And then since then, there's lots, we have lots of remote cameras all over the place and we've documented, uh, Jeff was seeing this on the photos, other places where we had uh, king tail. So this is another male out in the western Santa Monica's. Uh, this is one east of 405, actually. It was pretty interesting. Not one. These are ones we're tracking. Uh, and then this is one in the Santa Susana Mountains, uh, who turns out is P106. Um, Jeff was able to capture her as part of a of that road study we're doing in the Rocky Peak area. Um, anyway, so four different animals now in different areas with those uh, visible tail kinks. Uh, and then actually, we did some work with a grad student at UCLA to look at sperm quality. And that was another thing in, in Florida Panthers, actually. So there's, the condition is called teratospermia, where you basically have abnormal sperm. And they were seeing that in Florida, too, like 95 to 97% of the sperm were teratospermic. And so we looked at uh, three animals in our area. It's, it turns out it's not that easy to get a sperm sample from a <laughs> um, But we got it from a number of animals that died, three in our area and two in that Santa Ana's area. And they all had greater than 90% teratospermia. Uh, the mean was 93%. Um, this is what some of that looks like. So you can see at the tail, so this is a normal sperm here with a long, nice long tail. There the tail is all coiled up there. Um, and then there's another you know, short tail there. And there's even one with two heads there. Um, anyway, so, so relatively poor sperm quality in the mountains, mountain lions as well. Um, so the other, one of the other challenges that I was talking about is if you have development right up next to open space, um, how can that potentially affect things as well? And so one of the things we've seen is a lot of exposure to toxicants, um, and specifically rodenticides, and specifically anticoagulant rodenticides. I haven't talked about it too much, but we studied coyotes intensively from about nine, for about nine years, from 1996 to 2004. Um, and in that, this is the mortality from from, from that study, there were 60 deaths, and you know, a number of them, we didn't know for sure what happened. Vehicles was the most common, but the second most important more source of mortality was rodenticide poisoning. That's what happened with this animal, too, so that, that's not where he was. This is actually right there at DX, where we checked him out and we opened him up. Um, but he was just laying out there in the middle of the park, just uh, keeled over dead, basically. Um, and then when we opened him up, um, he was full of blood internally. So what happens is they, they bleed to death internally. These, these anticoagulants stop animals from being able to clot, right? And so then they run out of clotting factors, and then if they bleed for some reason, um, they die. So this is a significant source of mortality in the mountain lions, I mean, sorry, in the coyotes. Um, interesting story in the bobcats. So we really hadn't been seeing that same kind of thing. We had maybe one case in those first six or seven years of the bobcat study. Um, but we started to see in bobcats, this was starting, uh, the first one was late 2001 and then more in 2002. We started to see them dying from mange. So this is a notoedric mange, it's the specific disease and that's the mite that causes it. Uh, and their faces would get all crusted. This still happens, you can still, still see it um, these days. Um, and they ended up getting sort of super emaciated. That's three different animals that, that died of mange. Um, and so we had never seen this before. Actually, I hadn't seen it in my graduate studies in Marine either, and we hadn't seen it in the first six or seven years of the, of the study here. Um, and so um, we took those first animals in and had a full necropsy done, um, and I'll mention the results there in a second. But this mange had a big impact on the population. So these are survival rates for bobcats. So what these numbers mean is that's the, the chance of a bobcat that we're tracking surviving from one year to the next. So 0.83 means there's an 83% chance of surviving from one year to the next. And you can see these first five years, it was all like 75, 80%. Uh, but then we had the first case of Maine in late 2001. And then in 2002, we had nine cases. You can see the number of deaths went way up and the survival rate dropped to 50% and then even to under 30% in a couple of years. Uh, and this is one of those habitat fragments where we were studying bobcats. We were tracking six different animals there around that 2002 time, and five of the six died of mange. Um, and the sixth one, you know, we don't, we weren't able to to, to keep track of her. Um, 
And this is just another measure that we've been, we were doing for a long time. We were doing transects where we wandered around and counted scat. Um, and you can see the number of scat that we were collecting just fell off the table here around 2002 and three, right when the percentage of death from, from mange increased. Um, so lots of mortality from mange definitely impacting the population. But as I said, we took those first cases in, uh, and actually we often take animals into the state lab to do a full necropsy. And all those animals that had died of mange were also exposed to rodenticides. And so actually the vet there suggested to us that maybe if they're compromised, so typically vets will tell you like animals don't get really sick with mange unless they're compromised in some other way. And so they suggested to us maybe they're being affected in some way by being exposed to these poisons and then that's making them more likely to get really sick with mange. And so we definitely saw this from a statistical point of view. So here you can see animals getting bad mange and then being exposed over a certain level, 0.05 parts per million to these rodenticides. And so of the ones with bad mange, 22 out of 26 had at least that level of anticoagulants, whereas the ones without mange, only nine, um, nine of 21 did. So we, we saw a significant statistical relationship, certainly. Um, but then we actually, that same grad student I mentioned, Laurel Serious at UCLA, she did a bunch of immune assays of bobcats, which was, which was a huge project, actually, because these are assays that people have basically only ever done on people, maybe on cats, um, and she was applying them to a wild field, but she found significant evidence of immune issues related to being exposed to rodenticides, so evidence of inflammation, um, and also evidence of immune suppression. Uh, this is the, the paper about that. Uh, and one of the things that we saw, too, was we saw significant differences uh, in cytokines. And it's funny, because actually in the last five years, like, you hear about cytokines in the news or whatever, you know, with COVID uh, and everything. The pandemic and everything. But, um, but cytokines are cell signaling proteins that are important in the immune system that help tell the immune system what to do, basically, right? And so we saw in a, in a bunch of these cytokines in the animals, so the orange ones, our animals that are exposed to rodenticides, we saw significantly higher levels of cytokine expression in exposed animals, and actually these ones with the area with the arrows are related specifically, classically related to inflammation. And so one of the things we think that might be going on here is that you know typically cytokines help the immune system react to a particular infection, um, but if you get lots of cytokines getting cranked up all the time because you're exposed to these toxicants, maybe it's harder to fight off that the infection. Um, and then most recently, we actually, so another graduate student, um, Devon Frazier at UCLA, actually looked at gene expression. So this is one of these new kinds of things that people are doing with genetics is not just looking at the genetic sequence, but looking at how often are genes being expressed in terms of proteins. And we found significantly different levels of expression uh, in animals that were exposed to rodenticides just in terms of immune function, genes. Um, these are genes related to integrity of the skin, which is obviously important in terms of mange. Uh, and then these are ones that are associated with dealing with foreign chemicals like, like with adenocytes. So even at the level of gene expression, we're seeing differences between animals that are exposed to adenocytes and that are not. Um, and then just to, to give you an idea of sort of across the landscape, this is you know that same patch that I was showing you where we were following a bunch of different bobcats. This is in 2001 before mange, this is after they all died basically. Um, but then we actually had somewhat of a comeback of bobcats in that area, so 2009 and 10, so this was basically just you know an occasional male passing through. We had females come back in here um, and hanging out in that Rancho Simi patch and, and giving birth to kittens. Um, but unfortunately, a little bit more recently, we've started to, we've continued to see mange. So it seems like there may be a little bit of up and down in terms of the mange. Um, so 2017 and 18, uh, five of the six colored bobcats that we were tracking in that long-term study area died, and four of them died of mange. Um, and then in 20, 2018 and 19, and this may have been related somewhat to the fire as well, but um, we had a lot of mortality in the colored bobcats, again, two of them mange. And so overall, low survival. Um, and then of the nine where we know how they died, six of them were from Maine. So continuing to see this as a, as a potential issue. Um, what about in mountain lions? So actually P3, that one that was crossing the freeway a bunch at 119, he actually 
he had me, so that's a picture of him, which was interesting because that was the first time anyone ever had documented actually this mange in a free-ranging adult mountain lion. Um, but he died of rodenticide poisoning, so he bled out internally just like, um, just like the coyotes did. Um, and we were a little bit surprised because these are poisons that people put out for rodents, right? Um, and so how are the mountain lions getting them? Because mostly mountain lions are eating deer, that's their main prey. Um, but if you remember, right, coyotes, I didn't uh, specifically point it out, but like 85% of the coyotes that we tested were exposed. And both of those mountain lions, um, P3 and P4, that died of rodenticide intoxication, they had, they had killed, so these are kill sites where they had killed coyotes. So the next most important thing that they, most common thing they kill after deer is coyotes. Uh, and we know that 85% of the coyotes are exposed, and so we think that might be how the mountain lions are getting exposure. Um, you know, so people put them out to go after things like ground squirrels or wolf rats or whatever, but they end up in, um, in the, the carnivores, certainly the bobcats and the coyotes, and then potentially in the mountain lions. Um, and actually, so 34 of 35 mountain lions that we've tested have been exposed. And actually, we've seen seven lions that have actually died of so it's P3 and P4, but here's another couple of examples. These are big, healthy adult males in the Santa Monica's. They just fell over um, dead. Those are pictures that Jeff took when he recovered them. Uh, and then when we opened them up or had the necropsy done, they were they were full of full of blood. So um, the last challenge that I'll talk about is is the fire issue. Like I was talk like I was saying. Um, and fire is a common thing, but it's unfortunately much more common and, and typically much bigger.